And good morning and welcome to today's episode of Talking to Artists. So uh, this is going to be actually hmm, looks very dark. Sorry, I just want to look at my settings and make sure I'm good. Seems to be fine. If it's not working, then please let me know. Hey, Rhonda, can you tell me if you can see me okay? Because my screen looks really dark. <laughs> okay, anyway, I want to welcome you to this episode of Talking to Artists. This is actually uh, normally Talking to Artists is about um, really the casual conversation of, with a single artist to really help them to kind of um, share their thoughts, their dreams, their process, and also any business tips that they are using to help um, help other artists so that we can all kind of become more successful in selling our work. Um, today's is a diff- bit of a different take, and it's because of the fact that we are in submission season. So uh, usually January and February are when all the submissions for all the art fairs come out in, certainly in Canada, and um, this year is no exception. The exception this year is going to be that, um, you know, obviously a lot of the things are going to be potentially digital um, and even the outdoor shows, if we're able to have them, are going to be substantially fewer people, which means that we're going to have a lot more competition. So I'm just going to get Angela to join us. Um, Angela and I are going to talk about, uh, in our experiences, what we've seen, what makes a good submission, some of the pitfalls that people kind of run into, um, and then how we can make it work. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning, Kate. (laughs) Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> so just to let uh, people know, so um, as I'm obviously the chair of the Artist Network and Angela is the, uh, the director for all of our outdoor show, door shows. Um, so I've been on the jury of a number of different organizations who have asked me to jury. Um, and so it's been interesting to be on the other side of that table. Usually I'm on the front end of the submissions and the jurying. Um, and although Angela and I are not uh, the, the juries for the Riverdale Art Walk or Art Walk in the Square, we are kind of a fly on the wall, wouldn't you say? We sit there with the jurors, we can see the conversations, we can understand um, what they're looking for, and I have to tell you, it's pretty heartbreaking sometimes when you have an artist that you know is a strong artist, and they've just not put the time together to put together a strong submission. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, they, we'll, we're there to answer questions and to provide, provide additional information, but we don't make the decisions. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult sometimes. <laughs> you want to say... Well, really, that artist is a lot stronger than those images present. That's but, right, know, yeah. The submission is a submission. Yep, and uh, I think especially this year, I think we can all agree, it's probably going to be super competitive for at least the outdoor portions of any of the shows we're doing. So unlike the normal talking to artists, where um, it's really just a conversation, and I don't normally, I'll kind of keep an eye on the comments, but I don't normally actually answer the comments. And that's partially because uh, I'm going to create this into a podcast, which will be purely audio this will be very different. So we're encouraging you to come with your answers and questions and um, hopefully we can help the process along. So I don't know, I think we could just jump in and start. Like I think probably uh, the first thing that is really important and as myself, I'm not a huge detail person so I often don't do this as well but I'm training myself to, is to first of all research the shows to make sure there's a good fit. In Canada, there aren't that many shows in Toronto so the reality is, is they're pretty broad in terms of the types of art that you're doing. Um, That said, a lot of them aren't doing performance art and things like that. Um, Make sure you understand whether or not functional art is acceptable. Some shows it is, some shows it's not. So don't waste your time submitting to a show you're not going to get in because you don't fit the criteria. Do you agree with that? Yeah, we have that every year. (laughs) We we have that every year. We have uh, for the shows that that um, we are we organize and manage. Um, we have people submitting functional art, and I'm just like, oh, if you just read the first sentence of the submission profile, you know that it's a fine art show. So yeah, research the shows, maybe take a look at who was in the shows the previous years, um, but really you want to make sure that, it, that it's a good fit, like Kate said. Yeah, that's a good point too, because it's, it's good to be able to reach out to other artists too, because you know if you have limited submission dollars, it's good to also make sure that, first of all, you're putting your submissions where you really want to be, and if you're going to do that, then spend the time to do a good submission so you don't get, you know, deleted before you even get a chance to try, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to um, not get discouraged either, I guess. I mean, maybe we'll talk about that later. But I know um, that there's a lot of shows out there, but there's also minimum spa- minimal spaces in some of these shows. So um, just because you submitted one year doesn't mean you won't get in another year. So I would just say, like, I really give people encouragement to submit, but just think about where you're submitting. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and I think that all artists are, okay, are I don't know, I think you should never assume. Um, oh, we lost energy, but yeah, you oh, should I never assume, <laughs> should never assume that you're going to be able to get into a show or not get into a show. And that there's a lot of ones that are very unpredictable. 
uh, because the juries change every year for most shows. So you never know what the jury is going to be looking for that year. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I've seen in the last, uh, probably in the last four or five years, is that artists kind of throughout their, their career would start off with a lot of these um, outdoor local shows and then they would move to larger art fairs and then they would move into galleries. And those artists were often not then continuing to do the outdoor shows. But in the last four or five years, I've noticed a lot of those artists come back to the outdoor shows. And so I think the reason for that is probably because it allows them to build their relationships with their clients. They're pretty inexpensive to do, but what that does do, it means that the competition for those shows is becoming even stiffer. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, you see artists for yeah. four years or whatever, and then they're kind of gone, and then they kind of come back. Um, yeah, and sometimes and I'm, I'm always surprised that an artist... Oh, you're kind sorry, of breaking let, up a little bit, so I don't... Yeah, so I don't know if it's you or me. Okay, let me check my um, why, that I'm on my Wi-Fi and not my um, internet, just a second. Sorry, Kate, you're just chat. Oh, yeah, on your day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the other thing I was going to say that is a, is a really easy way to kind of do a good submission is to read the documentation. There's usually a pretty clear contract... Hey, can you hear me? <laughs> if anybody's watching, if they can tell me if it's Angela or myself that's a problem, then that will help. But I think it's Ange. Uh, but anyway, the other thing is read the criteria. The criteria is pretty clear about how many images you need, what size they need to be, whether or not you need a bio or not, what character count that bio is. So it's always better to be totally prepared before you start your submission process. Um, in some cases, you might need a booth shot. So, you know, you don't want to get halfway through the submission and then realize, oh, my gosh, I need to go and find the booth shot, right? So make sure that you have the, um, all those pieces in place. Now, I know, okay, it's Ange. Thanks, Jane. I know that a lot of um, artists, myself totally included, I just jump right into the submission stuff. And then in the middle of it, I realize I've forgotten something, but that's really not the way to do it. <laughs> so anyway, we'll wait for Angela to come back. And... Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, Ange has to let me back. I have to let her back in again. Oh, sorry. There you go. Okay, she's going to join us again. Well, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since I've had tech issues, so. <laughs> hey, hey. Sorry about that. I'll see if this works better. That's okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll switch rooms. No, I was going to say, it's been a couple of weeks since I've had tech issues, so I was only, I was expecting it. Okay, so let, why don't we start? I just talked about the importance of also reading the criteria and the requirements uh, so you know what to expect of you. And I think, why don't we kind of just jump in with um, probably the most important part, which is the images. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where most people fall down. Every year on um, some of the shows that uh, we review, um, people are sending in images of like things that are skewed the, the, or like multiple pieces in one, one image or like the frame and part of the wall and it's skewed or there's bad lighting. And I think, you know, what you want to do is you want to focus and get good images of consistent body of work, right? And I think yeah. um, that's probably a challenge for some people. Um, for me, particularly, for example, I do encaustic work. So if I shoot it straight on, I get a glare, a lot of glare, because it's almost like there's a gloss, like there's a gloss finish on it. So it's very difficult, like Kate, same as you, if you have, like if you've already yeah. put a coating, um, on your pieces or whatever. So I think a lot of too late. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think, and I think it's the other thing too, like, you know, a lot of this stuff in this discussion is not going to be a shock, right? Have good images, do a constant, have a consistency, do a statement. But the real problem I think is that people assume the judges are going to know who they are. Like you have to keep in mind the judges, the only thing they can judge are your actual images. And so it's, it is kind of shocking to me. I remember one, um, and I apologize. She'll know who I'm talking about. There was an image uh, a couple of years ago we saw, which was, a painting that was actually sitting up on a couch and it was beside a, like a coffee table and looking at it, you're kind of going, okay, so is it the painting she's documenting that's probably on the couch or is it a painting of a painting sitting on a couch with a coffee table? Like, I know it sounds silly, but as a juror, if you're not familiar with the work, you truly don't know. And it's putting you at a huge disadvantage, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you're right. The probably the primary uh, most important thing is the images and making sure you um, get them. Some of the shows allow you to put in a close up of an image and that kind yeah. of helps you because um, some some artwork is difficult to present just in a flat image. And so some shows will let you do a close up. And I think that that's um, a good thing to take advantage of if you have challenges showing the depth of your work or texture on your work or um, 
you know, even the understanding that there is a lot of texture in the work or a lot of, lot of mm -hmm. um, detail in, in a piece of work. I think that that is helpful. For example, we, and also the size, make sure that you put the size on the, oh, yeah. of the image. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we certainly, I was saying, we, yeah, we've certainly seen that before. I remember sitting and people looking at uh, an image and it's just like, well, it's okay, but it's a little bit unsophisticated in terms of uh, the pieces. And then you realize that they're tiny little paintings. All of a sudden you're like, oh my God, those are really amazing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think yeah. the size is important. Yeah, I agree. For mine personally too, I know that I always like to try and show big pieces because I like to produce big pieces, but they lose a lot of their intensity. So by being able to do a piece of detail work, then people kind of get a better understanding of the palette knife and how I'm using it and what it looks like and the texture. And um, I think, so if you have the opportunity to do, uh, to do a detail, I always think that you should take that. Mm -hmm. It's my yeah. opinion. But yeah, so I think me. we've added that to our submissions this year. Um, I put a note in there um, for people to um, put a detailed piece in if they wanted to, um, but then reference it that way as well. So I would say, title it that way so the jurors know so in right before the title of your piece or however the show actually asks you to do it but put it put it in there that it's a close-up or a detail piece or something like that so that yeah. we know or the jurors know that it's um not the full painting or the full um photograph or whatever it is that you're you're showing um it's, it's important yeah. to let people know that for sure. So we have a question about height uh, versus width and in inches. So under in most uh, in most shows, they will actually give you a criteria in pixels because that's that's like the Photoshop. So your piece might have to be uh, 1024 by 1024 pixels at your on their largest size. And this is where it becomes a challenge if you don't have Photoshop. I've got Photoshop, so I can kind of set up my files and I create my criteria for all the different shows. I have different Photoshop files for each of those shows. Um, it, it's more difficult if you don't have that. And I think there are some free um, ad sizing programs you can use. Uh, the biggest part really though, is making sure that your original file is a high enough resolution. A lot of, a lot of people take their camera phones and use that to document their art. And I know the recommendation is not to do that and get a professional photographer. But the reality is, is we don't all have the situation where we can do that. And especially now that's not going to be an easy thing to do. Um, but what I would suggest for myself anyway, is I do use my camera phone but I put it on the highest resolution and that's not the default of your camera. Your camera phone will be on a much lower resolution. So your images should be three or four megs as you take them out of the phone. That's probably one of the easiest ways to make sure you've got a high enough resolution. Yeah. And I don't know if the height versus width um, also means like, how do you actually present your work? Like it, like height before width, usually in a submission, it will tell you. And I would just say, please, 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 not just for the artist network, but pay attention to the submission guidelines in regards to naming your files. It's really, yeah. really important because um, people could totally misunderstand or you could be misrepresented. And um, I don't know about other shows, but the artist network, we're actually um, disqualifying um, submissions that aren't done um, accurately because it's so much more administrative work. Um, but usually um, in the design world, there's always width versus width and height. But I don't know if that's yeah. the way that we put ours. I, I know that some submissions might be different. So just pay attention to the specific submission. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I'm a little bit um, number dyslexic, so I can never remember. So I'm not going give, to give you a <laughs> notification on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I don't know which comes first. I think I think traditionally it's height versus. I mean, honestly, it's a fast Google to kind of figure out what's the traditional size. No, it's width versus height because I have a designer in background. You always did width. First. I always do it wrong. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, I shouldn't even say anything. It's not the same with art, but I know that in the design world, it's always width, and maybe that's why there's a there's a conflict. But like when we used to design, it was always width versus height. So you always knew yeah. that the first number was the width of a piece. So or I'm like sure you're right. Art yeah. or whatever. And the reality is, don't forget the jurors will be looking at piece of art so I mean it's going to be pretty obvious if it's you know 48 inches wide versus 24 inches wide but yeah you're right Diane I mean it's always good to put oh and Sheila says height times width purpose. so maybe art okay different because if you think of things <laughs> like an eight and a half eleven sheet of paper the width is before the height so it's just yeah but I guess galleries do height by width and I noticed that on some submissions it's like that it's just really interesting so people who come from the design world kind of maybe flip that around yeah. It's, it's so I guess even definitely. more, even more importantly to read the criteria, read the guidelines and make sure you get it right. One of the other things that used to be a huge issue was making sure that the size of your file wasn't too large. So a lot of times if you're having problems uploading, people would get frustrated, but often you're having problems uploading your file because your file size is too big. Um, one of the things I am finding recently though, is because I think of the, um, the increased maybe data or whatever that becomes is becoming less of an issue. And a lot of the 
submission programs are automatically resizing so you don't have to worry quite so much about that size but yeah that's i, I should be right i think it's a, the sophistication of the of the software um that allows you to do it it used to be that people would send in submissions and you physically get them through your email and physically get them sent to you and put it on your desktop and i think that was a problem um, now yeah. it's just they're usually stored in the cloud and are usually stored in a different format and i think they're usually uploaded into websites and stored on their server. So I think that there's um, a little more flexibility there. I'd like to recommend like, um, you know, less than um, five. Yeah, so I I'd think... say between two and two and five, maybe even yeah. two and yeah, two and three is probably, I think you can be fairly confident that it's gonna be fine. The other thing too, is you need to know something really important is if you are working in Photoshop and you have a small image and you make it larger, you can physically make that painting larger. But if you don't have the resolutions to do that, then that's where it becomes really bit mapped and hard to read. So yeah, um, you're actually you know, making the image look worse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so that's I, important. Yeah. So I think look at the submission guidelines, because I think there was one submission that I put in for this year already, and their um, image guidelines were quite small. I actually had to reduce my images. And I can I just want to point out, you don't need Photoshop shop to do that. You need Photoshop to kind of retouch and like other software to retouch and um, manage the images but even mm -hmm. just uh, the pc laptop just the image file when you open it up there is a way to actually reduce sizes of images it's a very non-sophisticated um, software that's on your regular desktop so if you yeah. have like um, word and all those sorts of things you can i think it's in that whole system like i think you just can open up the image file and you can go do that if somebody wants to reach out to me later i can show them how to do that but it's pretty easy and I think also uh, probably on your phone too, there's probably, I'm sure there's apps and stuff to easily do that too. But I guess the, I guess the thing we're really saying, it seems like a huge pain in the ass, but it's very important to take the time to actually do that. Um, yeah, Cause all submissions so, aren't the same. They're not all equal, right? They, they yeah. have their way that they prefer. And I would just say, pay attention to that because um, submissions get thrown out because of that. Yeah. So the other thing is that, I mean, I, I can just walk through. Um, so what I tend to do for my pieces, like Angela said, they're, um, They've got to, often they have a resin epoxy on them, which means that it's really um, it's hard to take photographs. So I take photographs usually before they're resined, which is a challenge because the color is not quite as saturated, but they, you get really get a lot more of the detail. And I usually take them outside. So today is actually kind of a bright, overcast day, and I find that's really the best time for me to take my photos. And I lay them flat, and I take them usually on my driveway. Um, and so that's kind of you have to sort of think about your lighting. Indoor lighting can often shift the colors of your paintings. And so that can be, again, in a situation where you're actually presenting something that not, is not very accurate to your work. So that's not always great either. Yeah, I've heard that said many times. The best is to just take your piece outdoors. I, I find yeah. it difficult sometimes to photograph. So I know I'm one of those challenged ones. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult to get all the detail in when you... Well, and I did buy, actually. I did buy a whole lighting system with a diffuser and all that kind of stuff, which was great, except I tend to be one of those people too that I, I don't, you know, some people kind of guess will produce their 10 pieces and then they will document the 10 pieces. I kind of tend to do things more on the go as I'm working. So um, yeah, so I, kinda, I found that it was a great system while it was set up, but it took me hours to set it up and I take one picture and I'm like, ah, it's a bit of a mugs game, <laughs> I don't know. But if you have a good system and you've got a good place to hang it, set it up, that's ideal. <laughs> So I don't know, um, I think maybe what's next in regards to submissions is maybe working on your bio and your artist statement and really understanding the difference on that. Kate, do you want to just talk about that for a minute? I got to plug in my device, I think, because I'm not on Wi-Fi. My battery is just really draining. Um, <laughs> sure, so I'm just yeah. going to plug in for a second if you want to talk about okay. that. Yeah, actually, I'm going to step back a little bit more because I think one of the other things is that um, you're, it's, it's often not shared what the judges are looking for, but there's pretty obviously um, the fact, obviously, good images, we've just done that one to death. But the other thing is really is consistency. So they're looking for a consistent body of work that shows them um, what they're going to expect. So if they walk past your tent or they walk past your booth when you get in, it's not going to be a surprise to them. They know what to expect based on the body of work you're submitting. So this is sometimes a challenge because I think artists see their work very differently than judges who have not seen their work before. So for me, if people are familiar with my work, it's behind me. Um, you know, I had, um, I had some help in doing a submission years ago and you know, some of my pedals go up, some of them go down. And uh, this guy said, no, you just make them all the same size, with them, make them all going the same direction so that the consistency is really clear. As an artist, I think people struggle with that because it makes you feel like your submission's really boring. But what it does do 
is it allows the judges to make a fast uh, decision on whether or not to accept or not. A lot of these judges are going through thousands of submissions, so they are not spending, you know, 10 minutes a submission to look through the work, and you have to have a pretty fast response. Not to say they don't do a, a job of making sure they properly assess it, but make their job easy, <laughs> make it easier to accept them. So, okay, so um, a statement. So an artist statement really is, is really about um, what inspires your work, what kind of uh, is what forms the work and what kind of is, uh, is the message that the viewer is supposed to get out of it. So in a lot of cases, there are some really tight character counts for bios or for artist statements. So that's, again, you need to really be important to look at that. But as much as possible, try and make your statement something that's going to be something that's going to um, make the judges think about your work in a much more creative way. So, for example, I'm inspired by nature, but if I put, like, I love nature, I love to paint nature, well, that's probably about 80% of the artists out there. So there's nothing in that statement that's differentiating my work from anybody else's work. So if that is your inspiration, then spend some time um, creating some language around that so that it can be a little bit more unique. For example, my sister Helen, who is totally inspired by nature, um, is also kind of inspired by the psychology of nature and the fact that being in nature creates this green bathing or shinrin yoku type presence. Well, that's way more interesting than kind of say, I love the trees, I'm painting the trees. So that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is we see a lot is um, people just copy and pasting their bio or statements right into the application form and they're cut off. So again, not only does that not give you the opportunity to share what you want to share, but it's kind of disrespectful to the judges where it's like, I couldn't even be bothered to figure out what the character count is. My bio is cut off halfway through a sentence and I'm okay with letting that go. Yeah. So the easiest way to do that is to just take your bio, put it in a word document and do a word count or a character count and pay attention to the submission. Some have character count, no spaces. Some have character counts with spaces. Some have word counts. So you just need to pay attention again to the submission um, requirements and just try to follow those guidelines so that you're communicating what you expect you're communicating, right? Like just Yeah. And I think it's important too, like take that step. And if you have 200 characters, use 200 characters, you know, don't use 112. Um, you may as well use the maximum characters that you have that be able to allow you to share what your inspiration is and create, again, that uniqueness for the judges that will help you stand out among all of the other artists that are participating and submitting. Yeah, yeah, I think so. What I have is I have a Word document. I have like 200 words, you know, and then I have a thousand uh, characters with spaces, a thousand yeah. characters without spaces. I have all different versions. Basically, you're just fine tuning your elevator spit, uh, speech and you just want to continue to do that. So... I've just reviewed my, I, I actually spent almost, I don't know, an entire day just working on my bio or my artist statement, really not my bio, but really my artist statement. I just spent mm -hmm. about a day doing that because I know I'm going to be doing submissions. So just kind of fine tuning what's really changed for me um, in the last year and how I've been like reflecting on my work and what's different. And I think that that's what maybe might set you apart or might make you a little bit more interesting to the jurors. Yeah, that's, and that's another important point too, is like you can do a lot of upfront work to make sure you've got your different versions of your statements and your, um, your images and everything. And then in a lot of cases, you can use very similar images for a lot of the shows, especially kind of in, in Toronto. If it's a very unique show, which only specializes in, I don't know, stuff that's inspired by the group of seven or something like that, then obviously you're going to want to change your submission based on the criteria. But um, you know, spending the upfront time, I think will serve you well for the rest of your submissions you're going to do. Um, okay. So then I think the other thing we probably should talk about, which is creating a lot of stress for a lot of people. Um, and this is specifically for the Toronto outdoor is having to have a booth shot. So the reason that the judges want a booth shot is they want to kind of have a sense of when they walk through the art fair, is it going to look professional? Is it going to look um, like a really high end art fair, which is what they're looking for. So, um, the Artist Network does not ask for a booth shot, but um, we might. Um, but that's the reason for it. So it's really important. And it's also very important to um, have the booth shot without your name in it. So the whole point of all of these submissions is the jury should be able to jury it blind without knowing who the artist is. And so that's another thing where you can your booth shot can get kind of discarded if you have your name in it. Yeah. So um, for me, I actually last year, a couple years ago when I did the Artist Project, I set up my whole booth in the Artist Project, but I didn't put my name in. I took a lot of photographs. 
Um, and I try and be conscious now when I hang, when I do a show for, uh, I think a like couple of years ago with Toronto Outdoor, I hung it before I put any of my identifying names in. But that can be a challenge if you haven't done these shows before. And I guess you're in that situation, Ange, this year. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's my situation. So actually, um, and I think it maybe is even more challenging this year because you can't just go use another space, right? Like we've done, the Artist Network has had like photo sessions and we've um, offered up space that people could book to use for um, photographing like um, things on wall. So the Toronto Outdoor submission this year, um, if you don't have a booth spot, they allow you to... Um, have some sort of representation on a wall or whatever, show part of the floor and part of the, the wall or the edge of the wall or whatever, because they're trying to also look at scale. And I think a little bit, yeah, they give you some guidelines. So they have some examples on the website. And to me, the one the examples they have are designed very well from an aesthetic point of view. Um, they're lined up nicely. And I think it also gives them an idea of that as you as an artist and how you're going to present yourself, like Kate said, professionally in their entire yeah. show so that they maintain the look of their show. Um, so I would say for me, what I'm going to do this year, um, so I do have a photograph, but my photograph of a booth is like one of a kind show. That's not really appropriate for the Toronto outdoor, right? I mean, I had a lot of small work that year and I had a lot jammed in my booth. Um, one, because you just don't have storage space. And so I just, I wouldn't, I'm not going to just go take that. Oh, here's a booth, booth image. I'm going to throw that in there. What right. I'm going to do is take a few of my paint paintings and put them on um, the simplest wall I have, which is like kind of like an off white in my house. And I'm just going to put some nails in the wall and I'm going to take a picture because really that's the best thing I can do during COVID. So I would say, yeah. look for a wall in your house that you have that's as white as possible, as clean as possible, clear the stuff again. It's a lot of work. But if you want to take the time to put together a proper submission, this is what they're asking you to do. If you don't do that, it's going to count against you. If you don't complete the entire submission, it will count against you. I don't yeah. know what their percentages are and what their jurors are exactly looking for, but that's my plan for the Toronto Outdoor this year. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing too is all of those little pieces, like having a booth shot that adheres to what they're going to say um, and doing, an, doing all of these other pieces and having your bio the right say, it, show, it actually speaks more to your professionalism as an artist who's committed to your practice, I think sometimes more than the work. So obviously they want good work. Nobody wants to have work that's not strong in a show. But the other part too, is that as an organizer, you want to make sure that the people are going to be there on time. They're going to understand that they have to be there rain or shine. And all of these pieces are part of the professionalism being an artist and taking the time, like Ange says, is, um, in terms of creating a booth shot, which is what they're looking for and understanding why they're looking for it is really important. Oh, so we've got someone, any tips for getting into one of a kind? Lots yeah. of stamina. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the one of a kind submission, um, so I was in one of a kind 2019, I guess, the fall show, the, the, the winter show, and yeah. I had to put together a submission for that. So I would say take the time. It's a pretty elaborate um, submission process. Um, but the reason they're asking for that again is because they want to make sure that you're successful at the show. I think that yeah. all, these, all these submissions really just want to have success for artists. So I would suggest yeah. take a look at all the requirements and follow them diligently. I know that you, like I had to do a whole um, booth outline of how I was going to lay out my um, booth and everything like that and include that. And I actually did a huge spreadsheet. I um, put down what art I would like, where I was going to put my art, what kind of art I was going to place, I arrows, my furniture, everything. I laid out the entire booth. So you need to plan your show from beginning to end. Make sure you have a website, make sure you have um, Instagram. Well, if you're on here, you have Instagram. <laughs> but make, so make sure you, you so. have, like, open up these, if you don't have that, because for me, everything was new. I didn't have a website. Like, I had to create all of that before I did my submission. Um, so yeah. I spent a good number of weeks just plugging through and just checking off what I need to do to become a showing artist, because it was all new for me. So I don't know if, um, I can't remember who the question was from, if they're an existing artist and they've shown in a lot of other shows. I know that One of a Kind also limits how many people they have in different categories um but i know they were looking for artists um I yeah well i think that's at one point that, looking to grow the artist community at one of a yeah kind. That, well that's the part that i was going to say too because i've done i think this is my third year for one of a kind as well um and there are some artists that show in the general population of the craft fair and there are some artists that show in the visual arts section so i chose to do the visual arts section um and this is always a conversation that has to go personally like angela was in uh, more of the general general area because you were also doing functional works and super cool um, like houses and candle holders and stuff like that. For me, I didn't want to do that. 
question. Um, so That's for me, I decided that you cater me again. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> okay. We're sharing the, sharing the love. Um, so I decided to be in the fine arts section because I wanted to have a, um, for myself and my brand and my presence, I wanted it to look more like what I would have at something like the artist project in doing so. Um, you know, it was easier for me to put my submission together because I could take photographs of, of shows like that, that I'd already used. But like Angela said, you have to figure out your, um, you know, where your furniture and all that kind of st stuff is going. They want to make sure you're self-sufficient. Uh, the disadvantage of being in the uh, visual arts area, I would say, is you get less traffic. The advantage is the traffic you do get tend to be more interested in fine arts. Art, so yeah. you kind of have to balance that for yourself. And that's a personal decision. I know there are artists that do tremendously well in the um, non-fine arts section and they have the reasons for doing that because they figure they get more eyeballs just literally walking by so but you know again I would say try I think the team at one of a kind is actually super helpful and supportive so if you have mm -hmm. questions um, I would reach out to them uh, Valerie or her team and um, Rihanna and they will they will help you be able to um, refine what you need and help you understand why they're asking for it because I think that's sometimes a piece that helps mm -hmm. So the booth is done. Um, are there any other questions that people kind of have that are just that we haven't really kind of addressed? I know we sort of babbled on for a lot. I think a lot of it really just is about putting the work in, <laughs> understanding their criteria, and uh, keep trying if you don't get in, really. So what else are you applying to this year, Ange? Um, so one of the things I did, I put together an application for uh, TAP, the artist project, this is quite a while ago, so that was in the fall. And I just wanted to say, one of the things, um, almost all the shows have a contact person that you can kind of reach out to. Um, because I do, I didn't know, so the, the, uh, the artist project allows you to do multiple applications, and I didn't know for my work if I needed to do that. So I do encaustic work that's like all encaustic work, but then I also do a lot of pieces where I do some inking on them. Um, which is really mixed media. I'm adding a new element and I might actually do like a rubbing on it, but really I was focused more on the um, Indian ink drawings that I do on encaustic work. And I didn't know if that was really two bodies of work. So I think that, you know, like we talk, like have a consistent body of work. And so I wanted to make my body of work very, very consistent. So I reached out to them and I said, and I asked like, should I, would this be like two different submissions? Like, would you consider this two different submissions? I think the Toronto Outdoor um, allows you to do multiple submissions as well. Yeah. And I, I would just say, reach out to the event organizer. So what I did is she said, oh, just send me some pictures. And, but, you know, she's so friendly and so helpful. So I just, I did that. I sent her, okay. So I think they had like maybe five or six um, pieces you could put in. And I said, um, these are the pieces. Um, I could just like the first three pieces, I could just do one submission and then elaborate on that. And then these other pieces, another submission. She actually told me that she thought it was actually quite consistent and that just to do it as one submission and that that would be like, they could see the consistency within that submission, right? Whereas I was yeah. thinking I needed to separate it. So I'm talking so long about it, but I, I think that no, this is a no. hard decision that other people have as well. It's like, does it have to be just one, like just the body of work that you're working on for the last month or two, because it's very, very consistent. And I think so long as you can see that the thread is the same work and the same feel they told me to just she told me to just put it as one submission which helped me right understand yeah, well I, th and I think that's better. I think that's a really good point we were talking about before is that I think artists will look at their work often and kind of say oh this is totally different from anything I've done before but for the general public they don't see that same level of difference and so um, I think you're right consistency is sometimes not in the eye of the artist so I find, I find what I find is helpful, especially if I'm applying for a new show or I've got work I'm just working on, is I'll actually send it to someone else, like a friend or another artist to kind of say, in your opinion, is there like one of these things that doesn't belong here? Or there are pieces that don't work together? Or do you think this looks consistent? And having somebody else's eye on your work who is not so personally involved in your work is I find super helpful. So we have a few more questions here, Kate. Yeah, so one question was the difference between a bio and a statement. So... A statement is often what, um, what people are looking for. And that's really what we talked about before. It's what informs your work and what inspires you to create and what keeps you going back to the studio every single day. Um, the bio is more almost like a, a personal resume or a CV. So it's, it really talks about a little bit about yourself as an artist, um, what, your, um, what your background is. Sometimes they will ask for uh, what shows you've been in. And so... Again, this is your opportunity, as in with any job interview, to kind of really put your best foot forward. So if you do 
20 shows a year, like I do, I'm not going to list every single show. I'm going to list the ones that have got the highest criteria or the ones that are most interesting or the ones that create the most varied look of where I've shown as an artist. Um, and so that's really kind of the main difference. Once again, um, in some cases, I think the Queen West Art Crawl, unless they've changed it, they have one line per show that you want to talk about. It doesn't need to be every show and it doesn't need to be the chronological show. Oh yeah, Sheila was saying the bio was in the third person. Yeah, like a resume. Like you wouldn't personally talk about this is what, you know, like I'm a great artist. It would be like Kate Taylor was a great artist. Well, I wouldn't say that in the bio, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, um, so that's basically the difference. Um, often those two get confused. We often see, I would say, um, bios uploaded in the in the place of an artist statement. But for a judge, the statement is being used for the jury. The statement is used if they need more information about the work that is not apparent just by looking at the visuals. So mm -hmm. the fact that I've done an art show in Barcelona does not help me, uh, help the juror to understand my work. The fact that I am inspired by the palette knife of Rio Pell might. So that's kind of the difference. Yeah. yeah. And then there's just a comment here about, is there a recommended minimum size painting? So I guess for different submissions, I'm guessing for like large paintings versus small paintings. Um, I think that to represent yourself as an artist, really, like what is the work that you yeah. do? Like, it, it seems to be, and I don't know if this is true or not, um, but it seems to be that that it's best to showcase the largest work that you have, um, unless you your whole um, your thing as an artist uh, is about like Marion Unit paints very small watercolors that's the way she paints, that's her thing, all this stuff is small. So then it makes sense to do that size. Um, but I think generally the, the consensus is that it's better to show larger work than smaller work, which is why having the detail piece is so critical. Mm -hmm. Can you I include I acrylic I, 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 Sorry, what, Okay. No, I was just reading the next question. I just want I was to make sure I say, it. Um, I, I think that it depends on the show as well. So, um, and well, what you have available as an artist, I'm actually trying to paint, like get a number of large pieces together for my Toronto outdoor sh um, kind of wall shot that I have to do because uh, I sold my bigger pieces. So I'm just like, oh, darn. I Congratulations. <laughs> but, um, so I just got a few in the works here that I need to just like finish so that I can put together a submission. So I'll probably be late on that submission. We'll see if I actually get it done. Well, you but, won't be late. You'll be within the deadline. You just yeah. won't be doing it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, um, I think that other shows are, for example, the one of a kind, I don't know if it really matters. I think what I tried to no. do the one of a kind, I actually tried to show because I wasn't going in the fine art section. I tried to show that I actually had work of um, different sizes because that would appeal to their audience. So think about the audience yeah. of the show as well. So um, they um, might highlight like you want to have maybe a piece that's smaller so that they know, oh, you'll, you'll be able to sell stuff and you'll be interesting to their audience, right? Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, the other thing I just quickly want to say, because you kind of touched on a little bit with deadlines is, you know, make sure you really understand your deadlines. We also see so many people that the deadline is at midnight on Sunday and they start their application at 12, 1130 and something goes wrong. Don't do that to yourself. I mean, you're, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to finish your application. There's a good chance the, the submission process is going to be busy and maybe you're unsuccessful in applying. Like it's just, um, you know, we get a lot of people that will kind of then, talk about um you know you get the phone calls or the emails the next day well i tried to submit but the system you know didn't work and didn't accept it well don't leave it that late and don't leave it in someone else's hands to determine whether or not they're going to accept your submission or not because it was late right yeah. again I, I mean it's, I get a, that it's disrespectful I, get, I know you I, do I get, I get people emailing me at 10 o'clock and then email or like let's say they email me so the last day of the show that you can actually submit to a show i'll get people emailing me like later on, I'll go see they emailed me at three o'clock, 3.30. And then they emailed me at like 10 o'clock that night saying like, well, why haven't I answered them? Okay, it's Sunday uh, evening. Yeah. I honestly <laughs> don't want to sit there and answer these submission questions. If you think you're going to have challenges, if you haven't done the submission before, please do it earlier. I think any show, any organizers would say the same thing. Get your yeah. act together. And if you're submitting at the last minute or the last, like the last couple of hours of the, of the show submission, um, you know what, it's really, the onus is on the artist, right? Yeah. Um, you, there's, there can always be glitches in the system. The system can always go down. Things can always happen. And yes, we'll listen to those things. But the reality is if you didn't get it in on time, you didn't get it in on time. There's hundreds of artists that, yeah. that um, submit and take the time um, and energy 
to pull, pull together a good submission, um, really, you need to focus on that and be professional. Yeah, I would totally say agree. Kate, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah. Um, and so the other a couple of questions, someone asked whether or not you could, um, you could have a submission with watercolor and acrylics. And I would say that that totally depends on how you're using your acrylics and how you're using watercolor. If you're using your acrylics, so that they almost look like watercolor, I would say you probably could. I think that's a good question, though, to sort of maybe put some paintings together, send them to some friends and see whether or not they think there's consistency. Or if you're really not sure, as Angela was saying, reach out to the organizers. Um, one of the things, too, that I have to say is that uh, Toronto Outdoor does have um, everything Friday or whatever. You can, you can talk to them and you can talk them through your submissions. And I did that a few years ago. And it's really helpful because it allows somebody else to come from a different viewpoint to view your submission and help you to hone it. So I would basically just encourage you to use all of these amazing resources that are out there, but not half an hour before the show submission closes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and, and I'm happy to do that too. I've done that for lots of people. Yeah. Um, I've looked at like images of submissions ahead of time and um, just giving them a bit of guid guidance. And I think that most event organizers will take a look at that and try to help you. They want totally. people to be successful. I want people to be successful. Yeah. The Artist Network wants people to be successful. We're not trying to make stumbling blocks. We're trying to make it easy for the artists to present themselves professionally and for the jurors to have an easy job reviewing and during the show. So Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, think, I think that's really everybody's goal. And I can't imagine a show that wouldn't be like that one no. <laughs> successful submissions. So yeah. um, we want you to get them in on time. We want you to have a proper submission. Um, I think one of the things someone's mentioned here that uh, some of the shows will give you um, information if you didn't get in later on, you can always ask that. You can always ask for yeah. ju jury comments. Um, if there's jury comments, we're happy to share them. Um, it, sometimes it might be a general comment the jury had. They didn't think the artist was, you know, potentially ready for it. The body of work wasn't consistent enough, but sometimes they're quite detailed. Um, but yeah. There's been quite a bit of discussion um, on an artist. And I've actually even gone back to jurors when an artist has asked me a question and said, you know what, I remember you guys, the jurors discussing back and forth, this artist is asking for some additional feedback to improve submission process, their um, submission um, applications. Um, can you give me some more feedback? And people have done that. They've given me more yeah. feedback. We've actually had phone calls with artists afterwards. Well, um, and I've, I've done a them. Yeah. I've done a number of phone calls with artists um, just in terms of helping them understand. And it was funny because one of them, she's like, yeah, damn, I knew I did a half ass submission. And she was a really strong artist. I knew her personally. <laughs> I was like, why did you do that? <laughs> so she knew. Um, there was another question about um, whether or not you can include sold pieces in your submission. I th say absolutely. Um, that's not a problem. One would certainly hope that uh, a good pe number of the pieces that you're going to submit in January might be sold by the time you do your show in August. Um, so that's not a problem. Um, I think really what they're not, they're not looking for those exact pieces that you've submitted to be in the show. What they're looking for is that kind of work to be in the show. So yeah, I would yeah, not worry about that. At all. I put your strongest pieces in and they probably are the ones that have sold. Yeah. Put the pieces in that represent you, but that are also going to represent what you're going to have at the show. So don't yeah. show, don't go in with one body of work for your submission and then really switch it and really shift it. Um, I just would like to elaborate a little bit more on Kate's uh, question in regards to, um, can you do acrylic and watercolor? I'd say if it has the same tone and feeling right of yeah. that piece. Um, but saying that doesn't mean that you can't put in two submissions. So we have had a n number of cases once, I mean, many cases we've had artists ask for a double booth and they're showcasing the same work in that double booth. But we have an artist that comes back um, multiple years, many, many years, and she actually puts two separate submissions together and shows two separate, very like different bodies of work. She puts mm -hmm. the booths beside each other and she presents herself almost as like two different artist booths like yeah. I mean she puts the booths together but they're separate and it's because she, uh, that artist understands that you're presenting one group of body of work together with an, and then another group that it's may, best maybe not to put that all together and mix mm -hmm. it up it confused yeah. the, the audience just think of it from an audience perspective what you're not doing is you're not showing the jurors oh I can do everything I can do this like I can do acrylic painting I can do Indian I, I can do ink drawings with watercolor washes I do that I do that all the time right um, I can uh -huh. do like um, figurative work or whatever but no my submission is not going to have one of all those pieces all my those submission's things is going to be my encaustic work I'm going to showcase my encaustic work so that's yeah I don't know if that we're belaboring this a little bit but I just think it's important well I think it's I think we belabor it because the reality is that every single submission says make sure you have consistency make sure you have good images and and so often that's not the case and i did i do think this year in particular 
you know, for example, Riverdale Art Walk is a prime example where normally we would have 180 artists. And if we are able to do it in person, there are going to be COVID restrictions, which means we might be at, what, 80 artists, right? So people who have been done that show for years aren't necessarily guaranteed to get in based on the quality of their work because they're, it's going to be just so much more competitive. Um, Toronto Outdoor, I imagine, is going to have to do the same thing. I see a question here so, saying, where do you find the link? I'm not actually sure what link you're looking for. Oh, yeah, no, I think that was for, probably for the artists. So if the Artist Network shows, is a good opportunity to talk about the fact that uh, we actually have three shows this year. And the reason for that is because we are really hoping to be able to do an in-person show. So there's a Riverdale Art Walk, which will be in June. We've moved it from the first weekend in June to the third weekend in June so that there's a higher chance we can actually do it in person. There is a second Riverdale Art Walk, which will happen in August. And then the Art Walk in the Square at the shops at Don Mills will happen in September. So the link for those are on artistnetwork.ca under submissions. I think the submissions will be open, what, in the next few days, right, Ange? We're very close. Yeah, We're just I'm, confirming I mean, links. I, and Yeah, I'm just, like, fixing some broken links. <laughs> but yeah. the, the submissions are basically open. So I would say, um, like, for sure, tomorrow morning, you'll be able to go in there and ho off, hopefully double check yeah. all the links and everything they are actually open you can actually do a submission the challenge is that just some of the links are broken so i just need to you just need to go in and review and proofread so tomorrow yeah. morning i would say you should be able to pull together your submissions but for sure you can go on the website and look at the guidelines of the submission there's a frequently get stuff asked ready. question there and get ready so prep your images prep your bio um but yeah, we're excited about uh, the shows this year. Like we're just like, yay! <laughs> we, we hopefully really we do hope, in person. <laughs> we hopeful that we'll have all these shows. And I think, yeah. um, again, all of that said, that the city of Toronto, it's all going to be based on the city of Toronto's final permit um, um, approvals and um, any guidelines that they impose on us. And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do the three shows as well, so that um, if we have to have less artists in, um, let's say, the June show. Um, because it has to be a smaller show, then we can actually have this show in August that we could have um, a larger audience or a lar larger um, artist group or maybe different artist yeah. group. Yeah. So just a couple of important things. Um, all the shows are hybrid this year, so they will be in person and online. And if the in person, of course, is uh, we're not able to move forward with it, we will still run online. Um, but they are also three separate shows. So it's not like if you apply to June, you don't get in, then you're automatically put over to the August one. You have to apply separately for all three shows. And um, there is no grandfathering because we really need to make sure we're fair to all of the artists in terms of um, because of our restricted numbers of the in-person piece of it. Um, and as many people know, the Artist Network is a member organization. So if you are a member, you have to be a member at the time of submission in order to uh, um, get the membership rates um, if you get accepted. That's really important. So you can't kind of submit now and then join to be a member three weeks after you submit or when you get accepted and accept and get the uh, member prices. So yeah, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the art walks, the Artist Network art walks, um, there is a member rate and a non-member rate. Um, yeah. and it's, it just basically there's a, say, a cost savings for the participating in the show, but everybody's um, um, able to um, put together a submission, whether you're a right. uh, member or a non-member. And, um, and they're juried as one. So I'm yeah, just I'm juried talking one. a little bit fast because we're running out of time. But there's okay. one more. Can you submit from out of the area? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have people that come in, that fly in to do the show. We've got people that come in from Montreal, from Vancouver, from BC. And, of course, if you are um, just doing the online portion, then, of course, it's very easy for you to submit. from. Uh, you do not have to live in Toronto. You don't have to live in Riverdale to do this show. Yeah. So... Um, I think we're almost out of time because I want to wow, make sure I can fast. upload this. We would have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? We talk all the time. It's amazing how much we can talk about stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I do want to really thank you for uh, for being my guest on the Talking to Artists. And I think we'll do this kind of uh, again with some other topics that kind of come up where we can uh, talk specifically about some of the, share some of our experiences um, and hopefully help other artists kind of all succeed, which would be great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much. And um, I just want to thank everyone else for being part of the Talking to Artists. So this will be on my Instagram, uh, my IGTV Live, and it also will be on my Facebook page, and I will put it on my YouTube channel, and I'm sure Angela will do the same for hers. And uh, coming up, we actually have a special one on artist for, uh, Talking to Artists tomorrow at 12 o'clock with the curator on the go. So she was not able to make when Thursdays, she can only make Friday. So hopefully you can join me for that. And then we have Sheila Davis coming up who I saw on this call. So thanks so much. Um, Phil Carrer, Carrier, Renato Foti, who is a glass artist and uh, 
Deanne Fitzpatrick, who is a rug hooking artist. So I'm super excited to talk to her. So thanks, Ange, and we will talk to you later. Okay. Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, everyone have a fabulous day, and thank you so much for everyone for joining us.